This season of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast is proudly supported by Tanara Music Practice Platform. Hi everyone, it's Tim here and I wanted to let you know that tickets are now on sale for my very own Piano Teachers Conference being held here in Melbourne in January 2020. It's called Piano Pivot Live and you can get your ticket and find out all the details now at pianopivotlive.com. If you've enjoyed listening to this podcast, reading my blog and getting inspired by fresh lesson and business ideas, then this is the conference for you. This two-day experience will bring together your favorite speakers, unpacking topics from creative pedagogy to marketing, preschoolers to technology and everything in between. You'll get all your morning and afternoon tea, snacks and a full lunch included in your ticket price. And while I know you'll get inspired by our keynotes and get practical in our workshops, what I'm most excited by is the chance you'll have to work with our speakers and experts in small group mastermind and implementation sessions to help you ensure you get a return on your investment in 2020. So if you've ever thought about visiting Melbourne or Australia, then this is your chance. It will be the perfect start to a new year of teaching, hanging out with other teachers from around the world, getting inspired, planning your studio and making real change for the year ahead. Buy your ticket now at pianopivotlive.com before they all sell out. Okay, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast, the place where teachers from around the world meet to share innovative ideas about music education. Listen and learn as we help you motivate your students, grow your income, expand your studio and become a more creative piano teacher. Hi everyone, it's Tim Topham here and welcome back to Season 3, 2019 of the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Have you guys missed me? I've missed you guys anyway. We've got a fantastic season of 10 episodes lined up and ready to publish each Friday from now until December and I'm delighted you'll be joining me. Now before we get into the guts of today's show, I wanted to talk to you briefly about my voice and this may sound a little bit strange but you may have heard over the course of this year uh, changes in the quality and tone of my voice and certainly when I had a listen back recently to some of the episodes in the 150s and 60s, I was sounding very, very gravelly Uh, and I wanted to let you know that it's actually... Um, because I have a vocal cord polyp and um, it's affecting my ability to sustain um, long periods of speech and adding to that kind of gravelly sound and rougher sound that just gets worse and worse the more I talk. Now, I wanted to tell you about this. Um, You may have seen I've actually put some pictures up of it on Instagram. That was uh, a little while ago when I was first diagnosed. Nothing to worry about. Um, I've been working on it um, using some speech pathology uh, skills and it's improved my ability to speak for longer periods but it's still incredibly frustrating for me and so I've decided actually to have the surgery. So if you've been um, wondering what on earth is going on with my voice and you've been a listener for a long time then I wanted to let you know these things do happen to us. I'm not actually sure how I damaged it. It certainly wasn't an obvious case of shouting or screaming or anything like that. I cannot pinpoint what might have caused the damage, but it's something that I now need to um, deal with. So that's all happening um, a little bit later this year. And so hopefully by the time we return next year, I will have a very clean, strong voice back like it was when I first started the podcast way back in 2015. Um, I do thank everyone for their well wishes. When I uh, put the news up on Instagram uh, a few months ago, there was a lot of people saying, oh, yeah, obviously, it's really sorry to hear that, thinking of you. Um, and also a lot of stories came out about how common this actually is, particularly for teachers. And so I do want to let you know that if you are a teacher, particularly in a classroom situation, and I was a PE teacher for quite a few years and an outdoor education teacher, Guys, just look after your voices. It is so, so, so important. I'm lucky that this is one that, uh, something that can be fixed relatively easily. Um, But uh, yeah, I know of other teachers who spend all their day shouting uh, on football fields and things like that that really do some significant damage. And of course, it's very common in singers too. So um, yeah, look after yourselves out there. And if you do have any questions about vocal polyps, then I know a bit more about it now. Okay, so let's get on with today's show. In episode number 171, which is where we are today, we're going to kick off the season with a look at songwriting 
and how you could use songwriting to inspire your own students. And as I was recording today's show, I realized how beautifully these ideas align with my four chord composing framework. Now, if you're not familiar with my four chord composing framework, you can head to timtopham.com slash chords to read all about it and grab a free lesson plan. But basically, I love more than anything exploring chord progressions with students, helping them build their own, and most importantly, helping students realize just how simple construction of chord progressions in a pop music style is. It is dead easy. Anyone can do it with basically no ability or understanding of music at all, which is why I guess pop music can be quite easy to play when you just look at the chord progressions. So today we're going to cover a few topics um, like why you can teach songwriting even if you've never done it before. We're going to give you some strategies to get started. And we'll talk about things like whether to start with melody or lyrics or actually start with the chords and heaps more. And I've got a great guest joining me who I'll introduce to you in just a moment because I'm not a specialist in songwriting. In fact, I find, as you'll hear in this episode, uh, I feel that my lyric writing ability isn't actually that strong uh, and is something I need to work on. And you'll hear that I get some tips for that today. For today's show notes, links, and a full transcript, just type timtopham.com slash episode 171 into your favorite browser. And Inner Circle members, you guys can find everything linked to inside the member forums. Now, you'll be really pleased to know that I'm giving away a freebie for the very first episode of this season. I always love throwing some freebies around for you guys. So what we're doing is we're giving away a songwriting power pack to kick off this style of teaching in your studio or to help you explore this in your own practice. If you've ever wondered about whether songwriting is an approach that would suit some of your students or perhaps you've explored the four chord composing course and wondered how you could help students turn those progressions into songs, then this will help you get started. The freebie today features four excerpts from the book that we'll be unpacking with its author today in the interview. And you'll get four different excerpts. We'll talk about getting started. We're going to have um, a list of favorite songs that you can refer to. We're going to talk about lyrics and rhythm, and you're going to get uh, some information on creativity. So if you'd like a free kickstart to your own exploration of songwriting in your studio, totally free, then head to the show notes page at timtopham.com slash episode 171, enter your email. And of course, if you're an Inner Circle member, just log into the Academy. My guest today holds a bachelor's degree in music composition from the University of Southern California's Thornton School of Music. She worked for many years as a proofreader copyist for film composers at Universal Studios, Warner Brothers and Disney. She's a prolific composer and lyricist and lifelong pianist and maintains an active piano studio where she enjoys teaching piano, music composition and songwriting. It's great to have you on the show, Lisa Donovan Lucas. It's really a big honor for me too, because it's, You're just so inspiring. I love your podcast so much. Oh, thank you very much. I heard just before we started that uh, Shelly Davis from the Piano Parent Podcast got you on before me, but that was ages ago, right? Yeah, ages ago. So it was good practice. (laughs) <laughs> it's all good. I love what Shelly does over at her podcast too. So yeah, um, what I thought fantastic. we might do before we start unpacking songwriting, which is what I want to talk with you about because you've written a fantastic book about this. Can we hear just a little bit more about your own journey as a teacher and what you're up to now? Um, yeah, I actually, um, I started teaching relatively later on in life. I was um, a music copyist and proofreader for film composers and television composers for about 20 years. And I also sang and played piano in piano bars Mm. during that time as well. So um, about 15 years ago, I kind of segued into teaching piano and um, kind of on the side and just fell in love with it. So that's my background as far as that. And um, my childhood piano teacher was um, in addition to teaching me his traditional piano, he was a composer as well. So he taught me how to write music and encouraged me with songwriting right from the start. So I think that's why I include that as well in my studio. Mm, It's interesting because that could go, uh, or most students who have been taught very classically, but who now teach a lot of pop and songwriting and things tend to have just done all of that themselves on the side without their teacher's help. So yeah. it's actually quite refreshing that you've had a teacher who actually worked with you on that. 
I feel I was so lucky. Um, he was a traditional teacher, so I learned classical, every all the repertoire and everything. But he had also um, been kind of a music director, I think, in the army back in the day. So he taught, he directed Guys and Dolls, he did musicals, he so he just had this other side of him. And um, so at the end of every lesson, he would we would do a pop song um, just at the end. And I did that my whole, like I started with him when I was six through high school. And so it's sort of always there, that part of it too. What made you decide to start teaching? Um, I decided that, well, the music copying was at that time, it was really, really long hours and really unpredictable schedule. And my son was now 10 years old and I felt like I was just missing out on his life. Mm. So I erroneously thought, I'll just teach piano. That'll be, I can do that. <laughs> and I'll give I got me more time like, with my children. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I mean, I did have a freer schedule that I could rely upon. So that solved that. But I erroneously thought that it would just be something simple for me to get into. And I, I just had so much to learn because it wasn't really my background. Mm. So that was um, very interesting. And I went to a lot of conventions and, took lessons from a teacher who taught me teaching and um, I still, still do. Mm. That kind of thing. And so. how many years have you been teaching now? Um, 15, about 15 years. Oh, great. So, uh, and just now starting to feel a little bit more confident. Like it's just, it's just a long road, you know. It takes so. a while. Yeah. I mean, I came to formal piano teaching later as well. I had about a 10 yeah. year break after I finished university before I got into it. And that was about yeah. 20, or 2008 or nine ish. Yeah. So it's only been about 10 years too. And I I understand what that's like, but the thing, the advantage I think we have in someone, people who have had a break or have come to it later on is we come to it with different experiences, life experiences, different visions of what we can achieve as well. I wonder if, do you feel the same that the experiences that you've had in the work that you've done has helped you decide what you're going to do in your lessons? Yeah, I think um, it does because if students come and they want to, they bring a song in or they say they've been watching YouTube or whatever. If I had had YouTube as a kid, I would be doing that very same thing. Like I'm Mm. not, I'm just like kind of, oh yeah, let's do that because that seems normal to me, you know, and just having worked on films and TV with commercial music, having to figure out what's going on, having to, do that I can bring that into the lesson and I can teach that mm. pass it so I, I'm guessing that creativity is a, a big part of the lessons that you teach why, why do you feel that's important I think there's so many levels to that I think it's hugely important um, I think that being creative it's not just being creative it's giving the space to be creative giving the room to be creative um, is something that students can take with them in life, whether or not they become songwriters or composers or musicians at all. It's like to be creative, there's certain things that you can do, like just unplug rather than plug. You know, life is so busy now. So having the skill to just, it's almost like meditation and it's a drop in cortisol. It's just a way to kind of zone in and, ooh, look at the clouds and just allow things to come to you. Um, that students can have that in their daily life. And um, I think that we all have the capacity to create. We all have the ability, um, but we just have to give ourselves permission, permission to be bad, permission (laughs) to write a terrible song and throw it out. Things like that are valuable and powerful. Yeah, you certainly mentioned a number of times in your book about getting space and uh using the world around you as inspiration for what you might be might be writing, which I think is very powerful. And I agree that creativity does take space. It takes brain space. It takes time space as well. Time Unfortunately, space, yeah. those, those two things are in such short supply for both us as adults and our children. That's very difficult, isn't it, to find that? Yeah. And I, I, I might be remembering my childhood through rose-colored, I mean, it's <laughs> rose-tinted ago, glasses. Know. Yeah. I feel like, there was time. And when I, some of my students are so jam packed and like you said, us as well, that to create that extra time in your life where you just don't have much going on is a challenge. But even if it's for five minutes, that counts like five minutes, do some writing or walk around the block or brush your teeth and 
think about something and just coming at life that way, that can be valuable. Mm. I was reading a book the other day that was talking about why we often come up with great ideas in the shower. And it was all, it was all about yeah. finding, finding those times in the day when you're doing something routinal, routine based that doesn't require your concentration. And that's when your mind starts to process and think on another level. Yes. Yeah, you might just be kind of zoned, you think you're zoned out, but that's when you might think of a great title or mm. something yeah. that occurred to you during that time. I have to have a notepad now after I get out of the shower. I'm like, oh, I've got to do all these things and I suddenly yeah, thought of yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> keep a notepad by your bed and by you wake bed. up in a dream, you know, that's a good yeah. dream. So why might teachers want to unpack songwriting specifically with their students? Um. I think especially for tweens and teens, it's a fantastic way to approach theory. And it's also if students are kind of making decisions like dynamics, mood, key, if they have to make those decisions themselves, then they start identifying with other composers and songwriters and they start to look at music, even their own repertoire that they have to learn with a new understanding and a new like, oh, well, why did they put that forte there? That's like, it, instead of just glossing over it, suddenly it has, carries weight, you know? So I think that's cool too. Yeah. And I, I think the other, the other thing that, and I, I want to get to lyrics because I really struggle with lyrics as a listener, yeah. you're probably familiar with my four chord composing. I love teaching kids to compose yeah. using pop kind of sounds. They love it. I love it. I'm quite confident doing it. And I've been able to pass that on to a lot of teachers. One thing I'm not strong on is lyrics and it's always been an area that I've felt uh, lacking in, I guess. So do you find that songwriters will generally have a strong suit? They'll be into the chords or the melody or the, the lyrics. And if so, how do you build the weaker strength? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I think that, yeah, some people are more going to, some people are going to be more the music type and they're not going to want to do the lyrics. And some people are more the lyric type and aren't going to want to do the, the music. So you can put those two together and they can collaborate. You got the, or if, you've got the perfect you, mix, right? That's yeah. uh, Elton John, right? Elton John, Bernie Taupin. Yeah. yeah. Things like that. Um, there's just so many d different kinds of songwriting ways to go, and there's no right or wrong. But if you wanted to become a lyricist, there's no reason why you couldn't, because it's like learning yoga or knitting or, you know, you're going to throw out your knitting. You're going to rip it apart. You're going to, if you do yoga, you're going to be achy at first. But you can do it, especially if you follow some of these exercises, you probably be starting to write lyrics. Mm. If yeah. you really, the desire was there and you're like, what songs do I love? What lyrics do I love? Why do I love them? And go in deep and analyze like, well, what's the subject matter? Oh, maybe that's a subject I could tackle. What's the, what is the rhyme scheme? I'm going to make one just like that and you're going to emulate it. And then gradually, gradually, you will start to do your own. So mm. that's one way too. The other thing I find is that compared to um, other people in my family, I tend to not listen to the lyrics of songs so much or I don't think about them. So I might sing along right. to it and someone might go, you know what this song's about, don't you? And I'm like, no, not really. I just like the music. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm already yeah. at a disadvantage because I'm not taking any notice of lyrics. Right. So you just might not be geared that way and that's fine. You can work with a lyricist, you know, but. I'll, I'll be the Elton. <laughs> you can be Elton. I'll be Bernie. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> let's, let's write our hit record. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you've written a great book and it's really well known. And in actual fact, one of the reasons uh, I wanted to interview you was because a couple of people had said, you, I really want to find out more about uh, Lisa's approach to songwriting because she's written this cool book that I use. So the book's called The Young Musician's Guide to Songwriting. What made you decide to write a book about it? Um, well, over the years, I've, I've had a lot of students um, that express interest in writing. Some of them are composers. Some of them turn out to be songwriters. But over the years, I just started compiling exercises for them. Um, basically, the exercises are just things that I do myself. So I just kept going, kept going, and I suddenly I realized I had so many exercises and I thought I could just put this into a book and I could create this for students basically that are in a music studio situation learning to play an instrument because there's really nothing like that 
there are a lot of books on songwriting, but they tend to be either for older people or just not so studio based. And I wanted something that teachers could use because students want to know how to write songs. I mean, not, not all of them, um, but that's why I wrote it. Mm. And what kind of age, you mentioned teens and tweens, obviously, um, yeah. being a great market for this, and I can see that. What about levels? Do they have to be quite good players already to get value from songwriting? I don't think so. I mean, I I even use it with, say, 10-year-olds, elementary school kids. They need a little more guidance from the teacher. But um, you, can, you can write songs. They might not be notating them or they might not, but you can write a lot of songs with, with younger kids. Um, but primarily I would say that an ideal age group would probably be age 10 or 11. Cause that's kind of sophisticated nowadays mm. 10 or 11 through high school, um, maybe even college. I mean, and even as a teacher, as an adult, if you use this book by the end, you could be writing songs. You don't have to be a songwriter to, to use this book. And we mentioned some of the, you know, the Elton and Bernie partnerships that kind yeah. of require a couple of people to come together. Do you find that some students with the work, uh, working through your process can be all rounders and create a song from scratch, music and lyrics yeah. together? Yeah. And I mean, some students, you can kind of tell, I, I always offer it to everybody from the beginning, but if they're not into it, I just don't force it, even with mm. composition or songwriting, but you can just kind of get a feel. And those I start right off the bat with, and kids are very open They're They'll just write stories and then we can shape that into a song. And I kind of help them along the way. And by the end, um, we'll probably do a recording of the ones they like and a lead sheet. Mm. Um, and then they have something and then we go on to the next one. Yeah. It sounds like, it sounds like a lot of great fun. Um, sounds like it could take a lot of time as well. So how do you manage this in your lessons? Um, well, I brought, let's see, I brought one of my lesson plans. I usually, I do the regular lesson and then I might give them, let's say, um, we might talk about a song that's on their mind and we'll, I'll say, do some automatic writing, just a page, set a timer for five minutes sometime this week at home and just write the first thing that comes to your head. Just no editing, no criticizing it, no judging and bring that in and we'll see if something jump out, jumps out at us for a title. So that takes them five minutes. And then the next week they bring it in. We do their regular lesson and towards the end of the lesson, we'll take a look at that lyric and I'll say, Oh, this would be a cool title. So now write this week, another five minutes, set your timer, write a bunch of stuff on this. Like just keep going, keep going and keep mentioning that title. Keep mentioning that title. Then bring it back next week. So we just every week do a little, little bit. And right. then when it starts to take more shape, we might devote a whole lesson to the song mm. once a month, the song. And then there's the recording date. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very exciting. Yeah. <laughs> do, do you tend to start, um, I'm, I'm going to kind of unpack the process now for teachers who are listening. Um, where, where do you begin? Do you start with the lyrics or chords? What, what do you do? Um, you can go any which way you want. And I've done both. Like I've written music first and then done a lyric and vice versa. But I tend in my own writing to write lyrics first because just for me, I, I, I don't know, I, I love stories in music and I love the, the rhythms that words suggest. So already like I'm kind of a melody starts to appear if I'm writing words. So I tend to do that first, but you can go any which way you want. Right. Um, and so for a, for a teacher, they could, could do what you've, what you've suggested, which is pretty much go and brainstorm, just write, yeah. do a whole, just write stuff for five minutes and don't yeah. judge it. Come back. Let's see if Come we can back. pull out something cool from that. And so you might yeah. start with a title or a theme and then they might go away and try and write some more. Do they have mm -hmm. to write in rhyme and poetry? No, not at first. Just get it all out on the page, which also helps with that blank page deer in headlight syndrome. Yeah. You know, like, oh. So they bring that in. And don't worry about the rhymes. And then as we have more of the story, we'll kind of map out like verse one, boy meets girl, chorus, you know, this is what's going to happen. Verse two, this happens, bridge, this happens. And then we start putting rhymes together. Right. Okay. Sometimes we'll use a song that they like as a template. So we'll mm -hmm. once they have their story in place, 
we'll use where the rhymes occurred in the song they like, and we'll use that as like our, our map. I'm delighted that Tanara is supporting this season of the podcast and wanted to take a minute to tell you about what they offer. Tanara, spelled T-O-N-A-R-A, creates an inspiring community for music teachers and students throughout the week. With students feeling connected to their teacher and peers, and because of the fun and engaging practice tools built into the platform, teachers can see a dramatic increase in the amount and quality of their students' practice. Teachers no longer have to worry that assignments will get lost or go unread. Multimedia-rich assignments can be reused and updated quickly, making any assignment a festival of creativity and inspiration. Help your students discover the difference effective practice can make. Tanara is available on mobile, tablet, and desktop. So head to tanara.com, that's T-O-N-A-R-A.com, and sign up for a 30-day free trial or download the app from your respective mobile store on your device. Let Tanara create happiness in your studio today. So let's say you've got you've got some you've got a couple of verses of lyrics and the rhyming pattern that you want. And I know in the book you unpack a number of because there's lots of different ways to rhyme or not rhyme, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, so you've got all that. Then what's the next step? What do you do next? Then um, we take that lyric over to the piano, and if 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 it's all ready with the rhymes and everything, do you mean? Mm, yeah. Like we kind of have a some we have a kind of a like rough lyric. Yeah. Yeah, then we go over to the piano, and these are students, um, usually I've taught them pop songs already. I've taught them in versions. Usually they at least know 145 or 1645, mm -hmm. so they already know that, and they might do some chords, and we start uh, just kind of improvising. And if they're shy about singing, then maybe they can hum, or I can sing, you know, just come, kind of riff along. And it just kind of comes together <laughs> <laughs> you're making it sound <laughs> way too easy <laughs> yeah i don't know <laughs> but i mean if you use the one six four five progression or one of those common pop progressions uh won't you end up with something that just sounds like everything else uh, wouldn't it be like i'm trying to think because there's there's lots of other combinations of the the chords that you could use so i'm just wondering how that ends up or do you kind of start with a common progression come up with oh, a, yeah. a melody and then change the chords under it? I'm just yeah. not sure. Yeah, you would change it or you wouldn't always use that progression. But even if you did, there's millions of songs that have that progression that are different right. from each other. But like, even if you did, but you wouldn't necessarily, you might just use one, 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 four, 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 you know, who yeah. knows? Or you could use a blues progression and do that. Um, we just kind of goof around depending upon the lyric and what kind of mood they're they're kind of after mm. this is where i could see the four chord composing kind of idea work quite it's strongly really with what you're doing very strong yeah because yeah, if you give them some of those tips about how they can combine chords that sound good then they could go away and come back with some progressions to then try and sing over the top of perhaps yeah and they can take songs they love they could take um, the chord progression from a verse from a song they love and a chord progression from a chorus from a song that they love. Now it's like, it's different, mm. um, but it's just a way to learn. You're, it's just emulating what other things. Yeah. And um, do you, pick, do you tend to work in the key of C? No, C, G, F. Right. Okay. So it's, <laughs> yeah. Minor, minor, yeah. Depending on their level. Like, some of my kids that are composers, after a while, I have some high school kids now, and they're they're quite advanced, but that's composing, which is kind of a different bottle of wine. But it's similar, you know. You could take arabesque and use that as a template for where the measures are, and write a completely different piece. But it's sort of like how painters learn to paint. You know, if you look at their initial start they're very imitative and then they have their own voice in the end yeah yeah i remember a very famous um uh comment by forrest kinney when i interviewed him he said something about um how painters and sculptors when they begin they all copy the masters to learn the technique but if exactly. they keep on doing that then they're called counterfeiters and he was yeah. using that in relation to the tradition of music education of we always just play other people's works. Why do we do that? Why don't we make our own up? Are we just counterfeiters? <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, I, I, 
I can't remember, is this Stravinsky who said this? Somebody said this. Musical genius is, is learning who to steal from. Uh, knowing who to steal from. Something yeah, like right. that. Yeah, so you're yeah. not going to steal, but you are going to, it's all borrowed and, and then made your own. Mm. So going back to your process, we've we've done the lyrics. We so we we got the story together. We got the lyrics. To, we we sorted out the rhyme. We mucked around with some chord progressions. <laughs> and you, I can imagine a lot of sing a lot of children not being very comfortable singing when they don't know. I mean, it's hard enough getting them to sing a song they like, let alone make up a song on the spot. So how do you encourage that step? Because I imagine that's a real challenge. Yeah. That's the challenge, and that's where I just think. Some of your students are going to want to do this and some of them are not going to want to do this. Mm. And and some of them are going to be composers for that reason. They're not going to want to do songwriting, but I just, I don't know. I have a lot of kids that do like to sing and play. And for those, then I'll fan the flames Mm. of that. And um, yeah. And I do have one student who is, he's going to be 16. He doesn't like to sing but he loves doing rap um, backing mm-hmm. tracks. He, I don't know what he does. I, I'm not that tech. <laughs> but he brings it in and then he likes to do lyrics. He raps over it, the top of it. Writes over the top. I've never heard him sing, but mm. he just, that's part of his lesson. I mean, we're, he's learning to read and to do notation and theory, regular piano lesson, but that's at the end. Right. Okay. So he, he works on his rap stuff. Do you tend with, when you're working with melodies, do you tend to work with a particular scale, like a pentatonic scale, or just the notes of the key scale? The notes of the key. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. And do you tend to play them first or improvise, sing and improvise? Singing and improvise. Wow, yeah. that's cool. Yeah, because it's harder for the um, elementary students to actually play maybe the melody. Mm, sure, yeah, so no, you're right. If, they can, if I can teach them chords, and we'll just sing over the top or hum over the top. Mm. It's great. I would be fascinated to see this in action. You should, you should, um, if you haven't already, you should video record uh, this process from yeah, start to I finish. I should video. I've never done that. I wish I had because I've had some really amazing young writers yeah. that are just like, wow, out of the mouths of babes. Um, I did bring, I have just some little snippets I could, if you want, I could mm-hmm. read to you. Um, just sort of the, I'll show you. This is sort of like the free free writing. Okay, yeah, the, yeah. The, the student, she was like 12, I think, when she did this. And then she brought it back and we planned out what was going to happen in each verse. I don't know if you can see. I can, yeah. Um, so and, Lisa's, yeah. Lisa, for people listening, Lisa's holding up, uh, it's like a standard <laughs> notebook, notebook sheet. The first Here's one was the, just a whole block of text and now it's into okay. stanzas. Now we're planning, we're mapping it out. That's the bridge. That's her little oh, yeah. drawing. <laughs> oh, there's some drawings as well. Yeah, cool. And then we start to write kind of a free poem where there's a little bit more rhymes. Okay. And then there's more of that, more of her writing, um, more of that, more free poem. Right. And then... Um, and then from there, I help. Then we go to the piano, and she was a singer. Can you read out but, what, um, what what she did? Oh yeah. Is she okay yeah. with that? I'll just read a little snippets. Yeah. So um, to believe in yourself is hard. First, you need to give yourself confidence. You can't believe in someone else before you believe in yourself, and it just goes on and on and on. But from that, we we plucked out believe was going to be the title. Ah, uh, cool. Then the next week was sort of the planning session. Um, she wanted the the character to be fourteen or fifteen. She wrote down blonde hair and pretty. <laughs> um, of course, <laughs> um, wears a red bow symbolizes um, her grandma who told her to just believe in yourself. Mm. And then the verse is: we get to know the girl, describe the red bow. We get to know she's more of an outcast. Feels like others might have more or are more in the in crowd, but chorus believe in yourself Mm. and it just goes on from there and i think this is so cool for kids this age because developmentally it's such a roller coaster at that time of their life they can like there's so many songs that are about like trust in yourself or just be myself and it's just a great creative way to kind of express how you feel about life you know yeah you're you're also getting it 
a more emotional level than most of us as piano teachers do. You would unpack uh, things that they're perhaps struggling with that they might associate with a, a character in their song. So it's not them, but it's in their it's song, but they're able to right. talk about it. I mean, there's some real yeah. power that comes from that. Yeah. And I also, there's in the book, there's lists of books that are, you know, like Charlotte's Web or um, Henry Huggett. There's just different books that where they can pretend to be that character and use that. It doesn't have to be them, but mm. it gives them, it's good for reading too and literacy and all kinds of things. So you're about to um, say before I interrupted you, then we go uh, to the piano. Can you remember what she did? Um, I'm just a girl with a red. Then we wrote more of a poem. And then by the end, I'll just hold up. Here's her, um, here's her lead sheet, which I, you know, I helped them put it into Sibelius. Oh, wow. Um, looks but, like proper know, music. Yeah, it looks great. Yeah, real, real thing. And um, this particular student ended up writing eight songs. And we wow. recorded them. And she gave her parents uh, a CD for Christmas of all oh, of her. It was like a real album. It was really amazing. Cute. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. There's a piano behind you. Can you could you demonstrate just how that start of that goes? Oh, um, let's see. Okay. <laughs> I'm putting Lu- I'm putting Lisa right on the spot here. This definitely was not planned. <laughs> <laughs> piano bar. Where's my fishbowl? No. Where's my <laughs> cocktail? Where's my cocktail? <laughs> I can't work with this without my cocktail. Okay. Um, but this one's, an, I haven't played this so long. Okay, got to turn my piano on. I'm just a girl with a rainbow in her hands. No one cares why I'm wearing this. All the other kids looking at their fancy clothes. I'm just the same, but nobody knows. Before my grandma passed away, she always used to say, Ah, uh, beautiful. Well. Well I don't need to hear me sing, but yeah, we can. Well, we, it sounded sounded great, and and I think that will give teachers a real idea of what what you can do. And the thing I picked up about that was it's really it's quite simple, but it doesn't have to be difficult. And most pop songs are pretty simple. They're pretty simple, just to the get them started. In the words. Yeah, yeah. Like I went, I had one boy who wrote a song called "You're a Plain Old Scorpion," and I think <laughs> they were just two chords. <laughs> yeah, plain old scorpion. And the chorus was like, oh, you little critter, you know, plain old scorpion. It's just Wow. Nice. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, that, that's great. I really appreciate you demonstrating that. And uh, thank you to your student for, um, for being happy to share that. Um, so after that, you have the excitement of recording it if, if the student wants and notating it. So how important for you is notating the final composition? Um. It's not important at all um, initially, I um, because a lot of their ideas are too advanced for what they would be able to do as far as notation, and I don't want that to um, like discourage them or sort of stop the creative process. So I just let them improvise, and we kind of come up with things. And I might just show them how it's done. I might write it out, and they can copy some of it. Like I'll just write it out by hand. And then they can copy it just to kind of get started. Um, and then I, sh- I do show them how to use Sibelius from my house when we're ready. But um, the older students that have been writing longer are able to notate more, but not in the beginning. Mm. And I could see huge potential here for using something like GarageBand to add drums and strings and things like that. Do you take yeah. that step as well? Um, I have not with all of the songs. Sometimes I just record them with my iPhone and that's it. Mm-hmm. But um, with some, of, I did have one student who loved GarageBand and we did some, we added some drums and we added some bass and she added background vocals. Because mm. yeah. that's the other thing that I, I love doing. Once the kids have come up with some chord progressions, you can then come up with alternate ones. That's verse and chorus. They can then play in melodies they can use the yeah. effects, which they love, add drums and bass. Yeah. And they've got, yeah. they've got a score, which is fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Um, brilliant. 
Well, that was that was really uh, such a great overview. I know I know we've just gone so quickly through it, and of course, the great thing is that you've gone into much more detail in your book. But you've also importantly given exercises that teachers can do with their students. But I know there's going to be some teachers listening going, I can't sing or I never made anything up in my life. How good do you need to be at this to be able to teach students about it? I think if you're you're interested in incorporating some of these ideas in your studio and you follow through the book and you could kind of cherry pick some of the ideas, um, that's fine. I mean, you don't have to be an amazing, experienced composer or songwriter to utilize um, and teach songs. And I think that if you go through the exercises in the book, by the end, um, you will be able to write songs and we'll be teaching them. Mm. Um, fantastic. Now you've offered a free download of, from your book, not of your book, but from your book. Yeah. Um, and I, and you gave me a few different ones to choose from. And, and the one that I chose was the section on lyrics and rhythm, which I thought was appropriate given, uh, my own challenges with that. And I imagine other teachers might feel that that's a, a, an area that they might struggle with. What will people get from having a look at that download that you're sharing? It has seven different exercises on lyric writing. They're, um, they're all pretty easy. They're, they are very easy and they're fun. And then you get the list of books that kids can read and use characters from, like two pages of that. And then you get um, a little bit about lyrics and rhythm and how rhythm is sort of built into lyrics. Mm. Um, uh, not, not the background rhythm, but the, there's an innate rhythm that's within a lyric line that you can utilize to create a melody and Brilliant. Yeah, well, thank you very much for sharing those with us. And uh, if you'd like to download that, as I mentioned at the start, uh, you can head to the show notes for today's episode and grab your download. So thank you very much for uh, sharing that and sharing your thoughts today, Lisa. It's been great fun. Where can teachers find out more about you and your book? They can go to, my book is on Amazon and Barnes and Noble. And my website has some more sneak peeks of the book. Um, also, which is Lisa Donovan Lucas with a K dot com. And I also have a Facebook page, uh, The Young Musician's Guide to Songwriting, that you can come by and be my friend. Like, like <laughs> please do. <laughs> please like me. <laughs> yeah. we'll, pop, we'll pop links to your Facebook page and to the book. Uh, okay. as well on our show notes page. And I, I must say, I really love the cover. It's got this uh, young boy standing at a keyboard playing in the sunlight. I, that's right, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and he's wearing a hat. Yeah, it's it, and he's in a singlet, and I'm like, that's a really cool cover because it's <laughs> it's so. But it, I, now that I've met you and spoken with you, I totally understand. That's that's kind of who you are, and it's it's about the fact that this is about knowing, really getting to know the child, and it's about being free and flexible, and it's not stuffy, and it's not regimented. It's yeah, I, I think it's a great cover. Oh, thanks so much. Yeah. yeah. I mean, definitely when you, you can kind of sense when students don't want to go there, I never force. It's like, right. it's just for the ones that are like, yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so before we wrap up, anything that um, we've missed that you wanted to mention today in regard to the process or anything like that? You know, just, just give yourself the green light, give yourself um, permission to to experiment, to fiddle around, to write terrible stuff, to know that like, I don't know, Van Gogh, everyone thought he was terrible when he was alive and now he's a genius. So just like (laughs) for it, it seems fun. And if it doesn't turn out, that's okay. You know, just keep going. Yeah. As I say to teachers all the time, you know, if, if you are going to go off the page, out of the books, into the realm of creativity and improvising and composing, you're going to make mistakes and that's okay. That's kind of part of the learning process that you'll have as a teacher while you help your students. And I find students only love you more when they know that you're fallible and a human and you make mistakes and you go, you know what? That was a disaster. (laughs) Let's try it again. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, let's go again. (laughs) <laughs> hopefully, hopefully with Lisa's book, you won't be making too many uh, disaster uh, lessons. Yeah, everything thank you. must be perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lisa, thank you so much for hanging out today. It's been great to chat with you. Thanks so much for having me. It was really, really an honor. Thank you.
I really hope you enjoyed today's interview with Lisa and make sure you go and explore her book and also, of course, grab the freebie that we mentioned right at the start of the episode. It features four excerpts from her book, all for free. Head to timtopham.com slash episode 171 to download it. So next week on the podcast, we're talking about getting value from professional development. This is a really important discussion because I know how much Many teachers struggle to be able to afford to go to conferences and workshops and buy programs and courses and training things and resources and things like that. And what we're talking about next week is a way to ensure that whenever you buy something for your studio, whether that is a conference enrollment or a workshop or a course or a membership like Mona Circle, that you get a return on that investment as quickly as possible. And in next week's episode, we're going to be interviewing one of my members who has done exactly that and has all the figures to back it up. It's a fantastic discussion. I can't wait to share it with you. I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Now, just before you go, if you enjoyed today's show, I'd love for you to check out my Inner Circle Piano Teaching Community. It's the go-to resource for piano teachers looking to continue their professional development, connect with other teachers and experts from around the world, and to access hundreds of world-class training resources, including our academy courses, lesson plans, teaching videos, technology help, and much more. Whether you're just starting out or have been working hard to build your studio for a while, the Inner Circle community will give you the skills, support and confidence you need to grow the studio of your dreams, whether that's about teaching a small number of students one-on-one in your home or hiring a commercial space, employing other teachers and building an entire music teaching empire. With courses on both the teaching and business side of running your studio, live coaching and our thriving community forums, you can get quick answers to questions, set yourself challenges, get feedback on your ideas and feel confident teaching in new and exciting ways. For more information on how to join us inside the inner circle today, head over to timtopham.com slash community and we'll see you on the inside. We'll conclude this evening's entertainment. Oh, thank you. Thanks for listening to the Creative Piano Teaching Podcast. We'd love to help take your teaching to the next level as a member of our supportive community. Use the coupon Piano Podcast for $100 off an annual membership of Tim's Inner Circle today. To find out more, head to timtopham.com forward slash community.